make Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on Don't forget the popcorn, Frank Coming, dear Now, in terms of your assets, you can avoid 100% of those issues by having a power of attorney. By simply naming ahead of time who the person is who's supposed to be taking care of your assets. Let me talk about the issues with the power of attorney. Um, the most common concern that I get from folks who are going to sign a power of attorney is that they say, well, I don't want to lose all this control um, over my assets right now because a power of attorney um, is literally an appointment of a third party uh, to take care of things. Uh, you people hear the word attorney and they say, but wait a minute, you're an attorney. Well, I'm a special kind of attorney. I'm an attorney at law. That means that you can appoint me to do a special thing, go argue before the court, um, because of some special skills that I have in knowing how to argue before the court. Whenever you're naming somebody to do something on your behalf, to act on your behalf, you're actually appointing that person as your attorney in fact as an agent, and that's what a power of attorney is. So, one of the issues is, how do you make sure that that person who is carrying around that power of attorney isn't using it at a time when you don't want it to be used? Well, one way um, is to have actually a clause in the power of attorney, a, a springing clause that says that the power of attorney only kicks in under certain circumstances, like if you're disabled. Um, the question then is, what is the standard? What is the standard you're using for saying that the power of attorney is going to kick in? Because if you say the power of attorney kicks in when you're disabled, well, who decides when you're disabled? Does that mean that the attorney decides when you're disabled? Does that mean your doctor decides when you're disabled? So there's an issue with putting in one of those springing powers of attorney, but that's one, that's one way to deal with it. Uh, a second way to do it uh, is to simply have the power of attorney held in escrow by someone. I, I have many of these. Uh, people who have executed powers of attorney, either they're holding them themselves uh, or they give them to me to hold with a letter of instructions to me that says, don't release this power of attorney uh, unless you have determined that I am disabled, at which point you can hand it to somebody else. So the, 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 the issue is to you know, make sure that the power of attorney isn't kind of just kind of out there. Um, uh, next, powers, um, people will typically take a copy of a power of attorney. I just wanted to mention that because so often people will say, do I really have to have the original? The only time that a person would need the original of the power of attorney, it has been my experience, is if, you're, if, if the attorney is actually signing a deed for you in the registry of deeds, which the person with the power of attorney has the power to do, if you have signed a, a so-called durable power of attorney, uh, and that's the next point. Um, a, a, what is adorable power of attorney? You see that word a lot? Well, until the creation of the adorable power of attorney statute, which we have in Massachusetts, um, the, the, the assumption was, or the assumption is, that when you have a power of attorney, you always have the power to revoke it. Uh, unless it says right in there that the power of attorney is irrevocable, you can always revoke it. And the courts always assumed that by becoming incapacitated, you have automatically revoked your power of attorney, and therefore a guardian was needed. Now, in order to avoid that, um, the legislature created the durable power of attorney statute, which says, if the power of attorney says right in it that you intend that the power of attorney will survive your subsequent disability, that it will continue to be valid even if you are disabled, then the power of attorney um, remains valid. So if that language has to be in there. The typical power of attorney that you talk to the lawyers or whoever about will have that language automatically in there. You, you actually have to ask typically to have it excluded. Finally, as I had mentioned earlier, if the power of attorney is going to be used regarding real estate, so if you're trying to give somebody the power to act on your behalf and you own a house, so you think that that person may have to act on your behalf regarding deeds or mortgages or whatever, then the power of attorney needs to be notarized. The other thing is that the power of attorney should specifically say that. It should specifically give the attorney the power to deal with real estate. 
you want to be real specific, it could even say that it will give them the power to deal regarding your real estate. You can actually refer to it right in the power of attorney. Um, some other issues that come up when people are talking about powers of attorney. Um, first of all, compensation. Um, should you be, when you give somebody that power and they're actually using it, so they're, they're, no, they're running around and doing your banking and doing other stuff, should you be paying them for that? Well, if you don't say anything in the power of attorney, the attorney is entitled to reasonable compensation. What's that? I don't know. It is what is reasonable. So if it's the amount that if somebody sued the attorney and said, you took too much money, he'd be able to defend in front of the judge and say that was reasonable. Uh, so if you don't specify, that's going to be the standard. You can specify, and you can say that the person who is acting with this power of attorney is to receive X per year or some kind of standard. If you do that, that's the amount that they're going to get, no matter how much work or no matter how little work that they do, but you may want to specify it. Gifting. If you want your attorney to be able to make gifts for you on your behalf, you need to put that in the power of attorney. Why? Because the person who is acting as your attorney is supposed to be acting for you. So if you haven't put a clause like that in, the, the typical attorney isn't supposed to have the power on your behalf to give everything you own away, right? He's supposed to be actually keeping the money to take care of you. So in order for you to, to, for them to have that power, you actually have to say, right in the power of attorney, that the attorney has the, the ability to make gifts. We already talked about selling real estate. You probably want to be able to specify that the person can sell real estate. To the extent that you want your, your attorney to be able to make gifts to himself or herself, even if you already have the stuff in there that says that they can make gifts, if you don't say specifically that the attorney has the power to make gifts to himself or herself, they can't. There's case law on that. There's a very obvious reasons. Courts wanted to make sure that attorneys didn't kind of get carried away in terms of taking care of your assets, in terms of who they decided was the most uh, deserving person regarding your assets. Now, then there's this question of, so do you want to have somebody around who is kind of checking on the power on the attorney as the power as the person is acting as your attorney um, now that's really an individual decision and once again that's really what a lot of this stuff is all about as you know I always end by saying um, the goal of all of this planning is to sleep well at night uh, if you have a person that you just trust completely and it's one of your kids it's your spouse it's you know you feel very very comfortable with that person then you may not need that kind of provision. But remember, and I'm telling you this from experience now, I've been practicing, oh God, so many years. Um, and, and one of the things I found in practicing, there are very few like evil people out there. There are very few people, you know, your nieces or nephews or whoever, who would actually accept the power of attorney saying, boy, I'm gonna show them, you know, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna get the money, right? More likely, though, there are, pe there are people who get into difficulties at some point. They find themselves under stress. They're getting a divorce. The creditors, are, they've got problems with their credit cards, and the mortgage has fallen behind, and someone lost a job. It is very easy for that person in that situation who is holding your power of attorney, and you're, they're kind of taking care of you, and they, they see all of these assets that they have access to, to say to themselves, you know, I'll just, I'll just borrow $10,000, you know, and I'll return it. I know I'm going to return it, and I'll, but I'll just borrow it for the time being because, you know, aunt so-and-so has a plenty of money and they're not going to miss it. And then, you know, one thing leads to another, and $10,000 leads to $50,000, and, and, and the money is, now there's gambling and the money is gone. That's the problem. The solution, a lot of times, um, is to actually have something in the power of attorney that requires your attorney to report to somebody, to say if they're acting as your attorney, that every so often, every month, every six months, every year, they're going to file something with some third party, either with you or if you're disabled with, the, or with some third party, that says, so here's what I did during that year, right? 
Now, the, the main reason for that is to basic, so that that person who's trying to make that decision, uh, you know, should I borrow that $10,000 that I'm going to return, will say, no, I don't want to do that, right? Because I have to report it. So I'm not going to do that. So it just kind of takes, it, it gets rid of that temptation. That's what I guess, that's all I'm suggesting. Um, so that's something that you may want to think about. Uh, appointment as guardian. You, you, you can, in your power of attorney, specify that in the event that a court, that for some reason a guardianship does have to happen, that the person that you've named as your attorney is also going to be the guardian. Um, that may be helpful for you. There are some situations, even power of attorney aside, there's really only, there's one major one, where a guardian needs to, um, or may need to get appointed, and that is if you are in a hospital or in a nursing home and you need antipsychotic drugs because you've got real problems, um, no hospital or nursing home is going to prescribe those or allow you to get antipsychotic drugs without being shown that there's a guardian, a so-called Rogers guardian, who has gotten Rogers powers. Rogers was the guy whose case created all of this. Um, so that the court has authorized this guardian to authorize the, the use of antipsychotic drugs. So it may be that a guardianship may be necessary. You want to make sure that if it is, that the person that you want to have as the guardian gets appointed. And you can actually do that by specifying it right in your power of attorney. Finally, uh, in bankruptcy cases, once again, one of the other nice things about being at Myrick O'Connell, I said, what's the bankruptcy issue? One of the partners at Myrick O'Connell actually is one of the Chapter 7 bankruptcy trustees and does cases regularly de dealing with bankruptcy. But one of the suggestions uh, that he made was, in order to avoid ambiguity, you may want to specify that your guardian, or that your, your, uh, um, your attorney has the power to act on your behalf to file bankruptcy uh, so that you don't find yourself being disabled and having a chapter seven and, and having creditor issues and having a chapter seven trustee have to come to your hospital bed and ask you questions about your assets so you, or that you don't find yourself having to sign those documents from your hospital bed. So you may want to specify that bankruptcy. Next slide. 